Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 15. By long forbearance is a prince persuaded, and with patience, waiting, not to be quick or rash, which we've seen throughout the Proverbs, not to be too quick, not to be haste. A soft tongue breaketh the bone. And it's funny because when you, I, I looked up commentaries on this bone, some said the heart. The heart has no bone. And with meekness, and what we've learned from the book of Proverbs with the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God. With the correct words and the correct procedure of putting the words out. What mighty the word of God can do. The word of God is called the sword in Hebrew. And it slices. Has thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee. Now, my intake of honey may not be your intake of honey. At least thou be filled with it, the, filled with therewith, and vomit it, vomit it. And what Solomon tells us, and it's true, too much honey makes you sick. I've known that. And not having excessive, at one time, uh, my sugar, and I took some honey and just took a little too much of my sugar, and I got sick off it. Honey is a natural artificial preservative, but we're not to have too much, as with sugar itself. And with sugar itself, we may not vomit it out, but it'll cause health problems. Taking everything in moderation is what he's saying. Withdraw thy foot from my neighbor's house. Least he be weary of thee and hate thee. It's your wearing out your welcome. Staying too long or always at your neighbor's house. You become a pest. You become, oh, people are always coming over. Or they come and they just never leave. A man that beareth false witness, a liar, Against his neighbor, which we found throughout the book of Proverbs, we are not to do it, is a maw, it's a splitter, a sword, a sword that slices, and a sharp arrow that pierces. So, what a liar and a false witness is, they saw it. Many false witnesses of Jesus. You'll find this in Exodus 20 verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You're a person that you maim. You injure. And you can kill. And usually with a false witness you are testifying before a court. Before authority. And it may be an injury case. It may be a case of death. It may cause death. As it would have been and did for Jesus. The trial that Jesus and they sought false witnesses was the trial to turn Jesus over to the Roman government. The problem with that was they couldn't get two liars to agree with each other's lying statement. Then you had one guy come up and say, well, Jesus said this, and he did say it. 
and they twisted the explanation. They took it out of context like nobody takes anything of the Bible out of context. Oh, here's a good one. Competence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of the joint. And no, I'm not going to say what you think I'm going to say. I'm gonna, you're looking at a painful and awkward moment, and I've had broken teeth. I've had through one of my jobs I had, I mean, where you, the job I did because of, because of the, the procedures we did, you would sprain your ankle, your left ankle, then your right ankle, and you just, you just kept going back and forth, spraining your ankles. Often I sprained my ankles, and many a times the company had to, you know, pay for me to go to the hospital. And here's a man, you can't depend on him. And it is troubling time. And if you're ever trying to eat with a broken tooth, there's either pain or you don't want to break the tooth more until you get to the dentist. Or that portion of the food that's in that part of the mouth doesn't get chewed fully. And then a the foot out of the joint, you, you can't step. Here is somebody in your time, your times of trouble, and time of trouble for Israel will be the tribulation. The Antichrist is an unfaithful man, but in in the tribulation period, a confident unfaithful man in their time of Jacob's trouble would be somebody that would turn them into the Antichrist, would lead them astray, or. You got problems in your life and you go to someone who can't help you. He's not going to be there. He's always on vacation. He's got other priorities ahead of you. You can't depend on him. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather... And it doesn't even say why. I mean, we see surety, a thief. Cold weather is coming and someone steals the guy's jacket, his coat. Somebody takes it because, you know, they, they didn't pay their debt, as we've seen in Proverbs. Cold weather is coming. And the person that needs that protection of clothing, it's gone. I'm reading about a, a, a Civil War soldier, and he's going into the boat. And when he got into the boat, he realized somebody stole his blanket, and it's going to be a cold, miserable, wet night. And as vinegar to nitre, which is a soap, the kind of soap, spoils, so is he that sing his songs to a, a heavy heart. Uncomfortable that you will be without an outer covering in cold weather. As a vinegar and nitrate so chemical reaction. And I would put this verse to my own thing would be listening to country music. Guy gets up there and sings, and he says, sing song two and heavy heart. You're just singing to a bunch of people who are down and out and just drinking and smoking. There's no protection from the elements. There's a, a chemical reaction. It's nothing good. I mean, country music is depression. And you got people who are depressed listening to it. If thy en enemy be hungry. 
And right there, if we were to take that comma as a period, if thy enemy be hungry, the natural reaction would be, who cares, tough, live it out. You deserve it. And we find this statement also, also we find this statement in Matthew 5.44, and we find it in Romans 12.20. We find it with the words of Jesus in the Gospels. Now the Gospels are separate. Listen, we got the Old Testament. The Gospel is not the New Testament. The New Testament begins when Jesus is dead. That's Testament. And then we got the New Testament from the time that Jesus is dead. So we have in the period of the Gospels this element right now. And Paul writing to the church has this element. If thy enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And when you read throughout the law, there is, you know, if he's your enemy, he's your enemy. Boom. Yet also Jesus said, you know, if, if, if your brother's ox that you don't like has stumbled, you're to help. If your neighbor down the street has an ass and you can't stand him and you find it, you keep the ass until he comes home and you can meet with him and say, hey, listen, I found your, I found your animal. That there, even if it's the hated person, there is no finder's keeper. And that is taught in the law, and it's taught in the Gospels by Jesus Christ himself, and it's taught by Paul to the Christians. Yes, we're to help other Christians. We're also to help our enemies. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Now some would say fire is judgment. That's not judgment. And there's also a thing to say, uh, there's an idiot thing, you know, of the superior scholars that, you know, they would go around collecting coals for their fire. They carry a bucket on top of their shoulders or their head and you would take the hot coals and you would throw it into the bucket. Why don't you just shut up, get out of the ministry, and get yourself a regular labor job. All right? Stop deceiving the people. When you help your enemy, you are putting a burden on him like, that guy hates me. I hate him. How dare he? But I need the bread. What? Well, uh, oh, I need the water. And you have put them in the spot that they hate you. They're your enemy. King Saul had to many times have an enemy called David. And David said, listen, I almost killed you. You, you, see, your, you see your skirt? You know, you're not to wear to what pertains to a woman, the man. And a woman's not to wear what pertains to the man. You see your skirt, Saul? <laughs> I love the Bible. You know when David held that skirt of the man, the king? You know what that told Saul? Now David didn't give him bread, but he gave him water. How did he give him water? He took his bolster, which had which was his bottle of water, his canteen of water. I got your canteen of bolster, and I got your skirt here that you wore, sir, man. I had, I was at the opportunity, saw I was close enough to you. And these, you see these three men over here, my kin? You know, the, the, the brethren of uh, David's sister? They wanted to kill you. But I didn't. And you know that put an anger on Saul? Saul repented, you know that. But you know, you just think, really think about it. I've been after David this whole time, and that man had an opportunity to me, and he, he let me go. And Saul only got angrier. You know, if, if, if I was at the farmer's market, 
and one of the vendors that hate me. You know, I, I mean, I, I want a thing of water. I'm, I'm hungry. I've not made enough money to. And I walked over and got the guy tomatoes or something like that. And what we got there, I hate you, but I gotta, I gotta thank you in hatred. And that puts it. That doesn't put a cold bucket around. I'm clutching for my fire tonight. And that enemy has a true hatred for you. You know what that's going to do? That's going to make him harder. It's going to make him angrier. So you've done right. That's the devil. The more you give to God, the more you praise God, the more honor you give to God, the more you do to God, the more you thank God, the more the devils just get angrier and angrier and angrier. And then when the devil doesn't take care of one of his people and you do, that just infuriates the devil even more. Dare you take care of one of mine? You won't. Blessed is more to, to, uh, to give than to receive. And the Lord shall reward thee. Written by Jesus, written by Solomon, written by Paul to the church. There is a reward amongst rewards. If you help your enemy. And I would go even more to say it's beyond bread and war. You got you got a boss you hate and he hates you and and it's just terrible, and you do your job efficiently, and he gets a good credit, a good valuation from your service. Man, I, 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 my boss said, you know, hey, what a great team you got with one of them team members. He's a Christian. But it wasn't for him. We would have not got done what we got done, and But there's a reward. The north wind driveth away rain. Does so does an angry countenance, your angry face, and a backbiting tongue. So if somebody is backbiting you with their mouth. And you just give them that angry stare. I did that with my wife. I'm going to go out and get some cigarettes. I, I didn't say it. I just gave her that look like. I didn't even say anything. You know, you, your children. You don't have to say in the public part. You, don't, you just got to look at your child like. <laughs> In trouble. That's what it is. You don't have to go swinging the bat and the rod in church or in the public place. You just give them that look like. All right, I'll behave for a little while. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop, up on the roof. It's not a good place to live. I wouldn't want to fall asleep up there. I'm afraid of heights, so I wouldn't even go up there in the first place. Then a brawling woman in a wide house. You can have an earthly mansion. If that woman is brawling, arguing, and fighting, and not to go up in the house. I guess Mrs. Claus was a bad wife. Because Santa Claus always had to be up on the house top. Mrs. Claus must have been a bad wife. But notice it doesn't say wife. It says a woman. It could be a wife. It could be an aunt. It could be a daughter. It could be any female in your house. It could be a servant. So why would you have a brawling servant? Maybe she's a good worker. Maybe she's griped and complains while she does a good job. This is a man that had a thousand wives telling you one woman who is argative 
My husband won't come home. Oh, you might be saying a little too much of a mouthful there. Because Solomon says sometimes that husband not coming home is because of the, the woman in there. I'm not even going to say the wife. The woman doesn't say wife. It's a, there is a female in your house, whatever relation, needs to be dealt with. I know somebody who was a carpenter, and we would joke about he would do roofs because his wife. That's not a good. That's not even a joke to think about today. That's serious. I don't joke about marriages no more. Never, I never really did. Marriage is a divine order by God, and woe be to any Christian that ranks and mocks. As cold waters to a thirsty soul. You're thirsty. And yeah, listen, you, you don't get just a cup of water. They give you a cold cup of water. Ice cold. I, I don't drink water much, but if, if I'm given an ice cold water, oh, an ice cold soda, mmm. So is good news from a far country. You know what good news is? You know what a one word in the Bible that would give you good news? And it's not media. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Good news. It ain't the newspaper. Romans 10, 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now today your expression, that verse, you would see a newspaper boy walking down with a newspaper. That ain't it. That's the man with the gospel. Gospel means good news. Gospel means glad tidings. When you got the good news, go in all the world and preach the, the gospel. The good news is not come to my church. We got a movie night. I just found today a church in Daytona Bay. We're going to go knocking on doors and and we're going to go tell people about the gospel. So Sally's got to go look at their website and examine the church. My number one thing is the Bible. And I didn't need to get to the Bible issue. I, I, I came to the staff page and the assistant pastor has a female name and a female picture. No, you're not going to deliver the gospel because you can't even do what the Bible tells you to do. And when I wrote or emailed her to tell her what Timothy says about the woman of certain authority of the church, I said, even if you are a King James Bible believing church, you don't follow the King James Bible. You don't study and show thyself for proof unto God that you are a woman in that position. You can't spread the good news if you don't follow the good word. Good news for us today would be the gospel. A righteous man falleth down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain that's broken, not working, shoots his water where it's not supposed to shoot their water. And a corrupt spring, it's been salted, it's been fouled. There's a latrine up the, up, the, up the creek that you're not going to be drinking. You don't want a, a latrine up the creek and have to make coffee down the creek. That's a corrupt spring. A, a spring where animals keep going back and forth and crossing. That's a corrupt spring. And that falling down is you're bowing down before the wicked. You're giving to the wicked. 
And now I will say it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you have your, your favorite political person or your sports star or your actor or actress and they're not saved and they're wicked and you give them honor you are a broken fountain, you are a corrupted spring that's been fouled. It's not pure. It's not doing what it was designed to do. It is not good to eat much honey. <laughs> okay. Verily, verily. How come we got more about honey in the book of Proverbs then we got more about the date of the birth of Jesus. Solomon in his wisdom, and I forget knowledge or understanding, one of them he lacks. He lacks wisdom, knowledge, understanding, I forget which one. He has two, he's lacking one. Of his great, what God has given him a wisdom, the writer of Proverbs, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and he tells us that he's written other poems and books and proverbs. He is a prophet. He's actually a priest, too. And he's king. You mean to tell me in 31 chapters he can't give us the prophecy date of the birth of Jesus Christ, but he's well enough to tell us about honey? Honey was not even allowed to be put on the offerings. You're not to burn any honey and fat upon God's offering. But Solomon tells us more about honey, and he says it is not good. To, it is not good to eat too much honey. It'll get you sick. You know why? Because honey's got that taste. Mm. You know, Jonathan was was coming back from a battle. And everybody was hungry. Jonathan was hungry. And the Bible says he took the end of his rod and he grabbed a little bit of hungry, honey. And he ate it. The Bible did not say that, that Jonathan stopped. Because Jonathan knew if I have too much of that stuff on an empty stomach or have too much of that even on a full stomach, I'm going to get sick. I just need a little bit. Imagine the great values what the Bible teaches us. What's one of them great values? Don't eat too much honey. You don't find that. No one, nowhere in the textbooks have I gone from kindergarten to associates of college. And yet in seminary to become a doctor of theology, I have studied countless times this thing of don't eat too much honey. That's not in the textbooks of evolution. The great scientific books is nothing about eating too much honey. Now we can look the bees, they go out and get the pot and blah 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 blah, and then hunt bees do their little dance and do their little, you know. Bible says, don't eat too much honey. It's not good for you. You're not going to have the consequences. And yet, can I also say, do you know somewhere else it says in the Bible when we read uh, uh, oh, where is it? verse 16, Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as sufficient. For thee, least thou filled uh, least to be filled therewith and vomit it. You know somewhere else where it mentions about vomiting? It's the sugar attitude that's in the Laodicean church age. The Laodicean church age is sugar coated. And it makes God sick. I'm rich, increased with goods, I'm wonderful, I'm clothed, and look how big the congregation is, look how many buses are running, look how many people visited us, look at the people that came for sunrise service, ooh, and God says, you're just, yeah. 
And it doesn't make the congregation sick, it makes God sick. And a Christian is to have sweet of honey and the word and the rock of Jesus. But don't get so much. I believe Solomon or Paul writes in about much learning. Makes you mad. Much learning will learn in Ecclesiastes is not really that good. Because the more you learn, the more God's going to hold you. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory, it is not good. Right, as much as you get, don't get too much honey, and don't be examining yourself of your own self-righteousness. Well, look how good I am. Well, wait a minute. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. And let's look at somebody who is looking at themselves like, woohoo! And let's see if they've got too much honey. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Let's check it out. And the number one thing today is sugar coating. There is no salt and spices in the preaching today. It's sugar coating. Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea is right. Okay. Verse 17. Here's the honey. Here's the sugar. Because thou, the church, saith, I am rich. Okay. It's okay to be rich. But did not Solomon tell us a couple of weeks, a couple of nights ago, labor not to be rich? Evidently, the lad that's seen church age has not studied the book of Proverbs. It's good to have a little extra money. That you can for your family and, and maybe go out, whatever you do, that's not a sin. But if you got a little more rich, a little more honey than what you need, and increase with goods, you know, they're goods, they're good, good goods to have goods. It's okay to have a car to get you to work, get you to place. It's good to have a house. It's good to have a refrigerator, maybe a freezer. Those are good goods. And you can thank God for those goods. But there are certain goods of the church age that are too much good for the church. And I'm not going to mention it because I really can't think of any right now, but there are things of the church they've got. Property. They've got so much property. They've got so much, so many parking places, and yet they're not using them. It's not giving God the true glory, but themselves and the world and the devil. And have need of nothing. We got it all. You got too much sugar. You got too much honey. You're praising yourself. Back to Proverbs. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory. Oh, we got great riches. We got all kinds of goods. I was watching the television program the other day, and this church, if not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars spent on this mega drum system. Brother, you don't need you don't need one drum in church. You don't need one. A drum is not needed in church. And there are excesses in the churches today that is not needed. I, I, I can't give a sample when it comes to, to me as they come. We had 15 people to come out for the movie night. 
We all got in the church van and went to movie night. And how many got in the church van to go on visitation night? We go to I did the church today. We got a great pipe organ and all that. Is that really necessary? And that their brag is, oh, our great pipe organ. I know a church back in Connecticut. Oh, we focus on, we got the original pews. And how many heinies are sitting on those pews listening to the gospel, listening to the growing Christ to get right? Very little. For so for men to search their own glory, self-righteous. The glory, their own glory is not glory. Look at Revelation chapter 3, 16. We're back in the church age. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew, vomit thee out of my mouth. And that your condition at the end of 17, thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me, God, gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. I thought they were rich. No, they were not rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. I thought they were, no, they weren't clothed. But there's so much in their own that they don't have anything of God at all. Then you're in trouble. Honey is good. But don't make honey your full diet. Salt. Protein. Carbohydrates, it's, it's sugar, vitamin A, iron. A woman should have iron, put iron in her daily diet. Vitamin C. I'm having honey, 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 honey. Listen, preaching should be sugar, okay, salt, thyme, cinnamon, Garlic powder, garlic salt, all the spices of the spice rack. That's what preaching should be. I'm not saying take away the sugar from the preaching. Put a little sugar in there. And you ought not to have, you know, and all, you know, spices, 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 and no sugar. That also, it doesn't make it taste good. He that has no rule over his own spirit, you can't control yourself. You have no willpower. It's like a city that's broken down, vulnerable, and without wall. You have got to learn to say no. You've got to learn to say yes. You've got to learn to say and stop saying, I can't do it. The Bible says, go in all the world and preach to God. I can't do it. you got to stop it. you got to control that spirit. And you got to overwhelm that spirit. I just love the honey and sugar. you got to say no. you got to get the measuring cup out. you got to get yourself a spice rack. Oh, I don't have time to read my Bible. Well, you got to put, you know, a little rule in your spirit. Say, all right, a little less TV, a little less whatever you do that you can't not put. I'll give you 15 minutes to, to, for your Bible. And don't forget prayer time. You got to be able to say to yourself, okay, I've got to dedicate time. I got to put something off for something terrible off for the good but 
many love the terrible and think the terrible is good and the good is terrible. When you run into troubles and problems. 